The views on this program do not reflect those of ONTV or its board of directors. Welcome to OAA Now, your home for Oakland Activities Association news and information. Here's your host, Sammy Taramina. Welcome to OAA Now here. I'm Sammy Taramina, blog around the OAA, the host of Last Three Brain Cells, and the host of Between Taramina's on Orient and Retosian. like to welcome the... Wo- to watch those on local voice on SoundCloud, those watching on YouTube, and those watching on Oriented with Tilgen. We got a lot to talk about this week here on the pod, obviously, and we've got um, two state champions in the OAA. Of course, we're going to break both games down. Um, of course, we have Southfield Arson Tech, that miraculous 36 32 win against Belleville. We're going to break that one down. But also, we have the Division Four state championship game that we had. Of course, it was a tense drama between. Our um our guests um coach Rob Odin and the Harper Woods Pioneers taking on the defending Division Four state champion Grand Rapids South Christian Sailors. So without further ado, we got Coach Rob Odin coming back here on the podcast. Coach, welcome back. Thanks for having me, Sammy. Um, when you look at of course the game, I mean the the game was built of course you know as of course the um a lot of people look at this game and and, and look at it and say okay, um Harper Woods. Taking on, I mean, like the um, first time in the Division Four state title game, taking on the defending Division Four state champion Grand Rapids South Christian um, Sailors. So, what was your mindset coming into that game, um, knowing that you were going to be an underdog in this game, despite having the most playoff points in Division Four? Well, our 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 game plan was just to be our authentic selves. You know, we don't get caught up in rankings and, 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 and things like that. You know, our guys understand that in order for us to complete the mission that we was on, we was going to have to beat teams like South Christian. So we went in there um, pretty, pretty fearless, you know, without any pressure. We felt that all the pressure was on the defending champs, you know. So, you know, we kind of prepared that week for our guys to be relaxed and to just be zeroed in and locked in. We didn't want to create an atmosphere that made this game seem that it was larger than life or anything like that. It was just another game for us, another opportunity to get, you know, better and, and move this program forward. And when you look at, of course, the kickoff of the game, when you look at, of course, the the atmosphere going into Ford Field, I mean, like, obviously, you have being the second game obviously helps a lot. So how are the kids' mindset going into that game? Um going into um, the Ford field. How was that mindset for the kids? Their mindset was uh, pretty solid. You know, the kids were focused on trying to limit big play opportunities. I mean, we didn't do a very good job of that, but that was our goal was to eliminate big plays, big plays and force them to drive the ball on us and sustain drives. You know, film studies showed us that their offense is explosive, it's, it's opportunistic, and they – they gain a lot of yards at the catch because of the, the gravity of their plays. They're a big play offense. So we wanted to kind of eliminate big plays and allow our guys to lock in on a specific task. And when you look at, of course, the game itself, of course, getting it underway, you got off to a very good start. I mean, like, obviously, I'm starting off the game. I know I'm. I mean, you guys started off fast. Obviously, in your game against Croswell Lex, um, you had that, and Goodrich, you had really slow starts in both those games. So, how important was the start against a really good Grand Rapids South Christian team? It was critical. You know, we knew we had to start fast, we had to swing first. Um, we had that mentality going in. We, uh, If we won a toss, we was going to receive. And then, but they wanted, and we knew they was going to defer. So we ended up with the ball first. We wanted to jump out on them. We wanted to kind of build a lead. Our goal was to try to get up three scores. We got up two. Of course, champions kept fighting back. We missed a shot on a big play, which would have put us up probably 21 nothing. And we felt from then we could be in control of the game. But just like in any other championship, that team has a championship pedigree and mindset, and we knew they was going to fight back. And we knew eventually, you know, momentum was going to switch. So we had to be prepared for that. And when you look at, of course, their quarterback, uh, Mr. Voss, obviously, um, I mean, you guys had some trouble stopping him. I mean, like, I know he scored a touchdown um, in the game. I mean, like, on a rushing touchdown. Um, what was your game plan defensively going against that 
experienced team that the Sailors had. Um, what was your game plan like going into that game defensively? Well, we knew we needed to, like I said, keep him in the pocket. We know that he makes plays and extends plays with his feet. Um, he's a hell of a passer. We wanted to keep him in the pocket and make him throw in the tight windows. So we was going to play. Uh, we was going to make everything look like man. We was going to play, you know, press and in their face to try to eliminate free access throws. Their offense benefits a lot on corners and DBs that play soft and off. and They take, you know, hitch routes and things like that and turn them into 12 and 15 yard games. So we wanted to eliminate the big plays, cup the football, which means we wanted to keep their quarterback in the pocket as much as we can. And we wanted to make him throw under the rest. So we was going to send five man pressure at him every play. And uh, we wanted to get some shots on him, you know, in terms of hurries and blitzes and things like that. That was our game plan going in. And when you look at, of course, the, uh, in the, in that game, obviously one big play I want to talk to you about was that big long bomb from, um, from um, Nate to, um, to Ramity. For that, it was a, I believe it was a 93 yard touchdown pass. So right. talk about that. Talk about how that play came up. I mean, like that was one. That was a play that I thought was I said that's vintage Coach Oden right there. Well, the play, um, the play before we got called for uh, hurdling a player, which was number two. You know, their best player. He plays both ways, and he's to our sideline, and he's talking smack to the kids and everybody about. Oh, uh, you know, he's locked down and he's going to shut everybody down and everybody's laughing. It's good, good fun. It was nothing like, you know, belligerent about it. But we said, well, we're going to come after you. He didn't know we was going to come after him the next place. So we put the call in. We noticed that he was playing press, but he was kind of caught eyes in the backfield. So we showed him play action because he triggers hard on play action because mm-hmm. he's a he's a heck of a player. And we uh, told Romani to delay or hesitate to start and then blow by him. Romani is a 200-meter track finalist, 21-7 in the 200. You know, he's one of the fastest kids in the state. So Mm -hmm. we know, hey, unless this kid has a battery in his back, he's not going to be able to run vertically with you. So we say, Nate, put it out there where only Romani can get it, and let's bump our head on the goalpost. And that's kind of what happened on that play. And when you look at, of course, some of the touchdowns you guys had, I mean, like, obviously, people are going to look at, obviously, with um, you guys having to hold on, um, that defensive stand, I mean, at the three-yard line, you had Sal Christian at your three-yard line. Um, What was your mindset heading into that final play where it was now or never? I was all smiles. I called that timeout. To just have the guys take it in. We didn't even really discuss it. I said, well, I said, look around, you know. They said, well, what's going on? Go. I said, where else in the world would you rather be than right here, right now? A shot at our first state title on the line. And it was just poetic. It was only fitting that our defense would have to come up with the stop. They had their struggles all game. You know, for various reasons, you know, um, but most importantly, hats off to them for playing well on offense. But going through the first four rounds of the playoffs, we saw a lot of power and and single or or double wing football. So, and, and, you know, Jacob kind of said at one point, he said, well, coach, we haven't defended a pass in a month. We've been, we've been in the box stopping a run, and these guys are throwing it 50 times. So it's hot out here. We haven't had to play in space like this. So I said, well, right now, you know, it's about, you know, three yards to separate us and them. I said, it's the last play. And we're when- going to cry. I said, we're going to cry. We're either going to cry because we won or we're going to cry because we let it slip away. They say, well, coach, let's run a defensive line stunt. And mm-hmm. that's what we did on that last play. They said, we've been – Rushing the passer straight up the field. They're used to blocking what's in front of them. We looped our defensive ends inside, and one of them was unblocked because the tackle set as he normally does for outside pressure, and we brought him across face inside. Javante was able to get crusher, make the quarterback throw before he was ready, and the rest was history for us. I got to get your thought process about grabbing the big mitten. 
you know, mm-hmm. it's got to be, you know, obviously the years that you've coached, oh, coached in football. How did it feel grabbing the big mitten for the first time in your, um, in the first time as a man? It was an outer body experience. It was surreal. It was 23 years of, of blood, sweat, and tears. You know, every year I work with the association, the Michigan High School Football Coaches Association. And every year I'm working the games. I'm in the hospitality suite looking down saying, next year is going to be my year. 23 years. So to finally be able to put my hands on that trophy was, 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 was the greatest feeling in the world. It was to say, we did this. And it's even more special because I did it with my son on the field. You know, so there was no better feeling than that experience that we could share together. And also you had your nephew, um, Dakota, on the field right. as well. Obviously, of course, you look mm-hmm. at, of course, um, you got Jacob and also Dakota. Um, when you look at recapping this season, I mm-hmm. mean, last year you guys went three and six. It was the first year in the OA. It had it tough, I know, with the young team. Um, and then coming into the year, you guys had a very difficult schedule. I mean, playing the likes of Stony Creek, Lake Orion, Clarkston, um, Roseville, that's your non-conference. And then right. having to play the white, which involves the Division One state champion, Southfield Arts and Tech, right. also um, Groves in there, and also right. Rochester. So talk mm-hmm. about recapping that experience for you guys. It was a, uh, it was it was it was a mountain to climb, you know, and that's kind of how we looked at it. Uh, we we feel like we play the toughest regular season schedule in the state. There were no weeks off, you know. We had to play our A game week in and week out. Nobody was gonna feel sorry for us because we was the division four or the class B school playing a class A schedule. So we knew we needed to play our best football every week. We won more than we lost, but we learned along the way. You know, last year taught us a lot about how to play in this league. And what we learned was that there are no weeks off. You don't get them weeks where you get to play everybody or your starters only play a half and things like that. Our guys got better by repetition. You know, they had to play their best football each and every snap. So going into the state title game, I said, yes, this is a big game. But it's no bigger than Southfield, no bigger than Clarkston, no bigger than Lake Orion, no bigger than Stoney. Like we've we've been there and we've done that, and the guys were unflappable, you know, mm-hmm. and 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 they delivered, you know, based on their past experience. The first thirteen weeks of this season had prepared them for the ultimate stage. And when you look at a course, you know. Winning, getting into the postseason, of course, having the most playoff points in Division Four, that meant having multiple home playoff games, which meant all those teams having to come to the woods and um, mm-hmm. and um, opening up with Croswell Lex in the first round. We talked about this matchup, and obviously, playing a team like that, you know, it was going to be a difficult matchup, be but with Croswell Lex in the first round, mm-hmm. and then you know, so. And people, and a lot of people thought, you know, coming into the game, I mean, like, coming in that matchup, like, this could be a matchup where Harper Woods could be in some trouble because they haven't seen a team like Croswell Lex. But you guys went in there, came back, and won that game. Yeah. We felt like, you know, our league play, the OAA prepared us for, for those games. Once we were able to figure out, you know, schemes and, 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 and things like that, we knew we would be found. We knew we would be solid. You know, we just stuck to, like I said, being our authentic self, doing what we do, and mm-hmm. focusing on the minor details that was going to have us ultimately being successful. And when you look at a course in the postseason, you went through Marysville, you knocked off um, you knocked off Carlton Airport in the regionals, and then beat Goodrich, of course. You know, when you look at having a play at a neutral site, and I know we talked about this two weeks ago, um, when you guys played um Goodrich over at Livonia Franklin, um, mm-hmm. how would how did you know obviously having to play at a different site, you know, you know, 
impact you guys? I know you played in a lot of different places this season and also in the past, but playing a state semifinal game in Livonia, you know, against an unfamiliar opponent, how did that how did that impact you guys? I thought it was it was it was very impactful. I thought that, you know, honestly, I didn't think it was fair, but I thought it was impactful. I thought it was more of a home field advantage for us. We did, we had like a 25 minute commute, which was absolutely fine with us. We knew that, you know, more of our fan base and things like that would be to come out, but you know, Goodrich travels extremely well and those stands were packed on their side as well. We thought we were comfortable with the scenario. You know, it was close to us. It was, you know, it didn't take us off of our, our, our game day prep script very much because anywhere we travel in the OAA is about an equal distance. So we use that to our advantage. You know, we slept in a little more probably than they did. You know, we had breakfast a little later, you know, all of those things that people don't think about that make a difference for us on game day makes a huge difference. So playing it in Livonia was very impactful for us. And then of course, going to Ford field, how important was the it's been the community been for you obviously you know you look at a course you mentioned it that the fans i mean how important has been the fan base been for you guys all season long it's been amazing they've been our 12th man they've been very supportive and i'm talking showing up to practice with you know care packages pre and post game meals or, or gatorade or anything that we needed they made sure that we were taken care of. And even in the games, we didn't need anything but support. They were there for that too. And this community had been one that hadn't had much success in any sport in the immediate past. So we felt like we needed to breathe life into Harper Woods. We needed to make a situation where they are proud to wear the maroon and white with the Pioneer logo on it. So and we think we accomplished that. And when you look at a course, you have the the experience you had, um, on especially on the defensive side of the ball. Um, you returned you returned twelve starters. I remember media day. I remember talking on media day even before the season. Um, that this that a lot of people said before the season started. You know, a lot of people I know around Division Four were not giving you guys, you were counting you guys out. And then I was saying to myself, be careful, Harper Woods here, man. They're in D4. Mm-hmm. And I'm telling you, you know, I mean, I think Harper Woods could give teams problems. So, and look where we're at now. You guys holding the um, holding the big mitten in D4, having to knock off the two, um, the two, you know, finalists from last year in um, Goodrich and Grand Rapids South Christian. Um, when you look at, of course, your defense, I mean, like, obviously, you you, you, you mentioned your defense. We talked about your defense. Um, how important was having that proven experience for you guys this season on that side of the ball? It was very important. Um, defense is something we made an emphasis in the past You know, our turning point was trying to create depth, and we did that midseason. Well, we were able to essentially at that point, after playing six weeks, we were able to two platoon. And I think that's what turned it for our defense. You know, gone were the two-way starters. You know, the guys that we needed to play both ways were now in the reserves role just on certain plays or packages. So being able to have an offense versus defense helped us out tremendously, especially in practice. We were able to go good on good. Our scout team looks got a lot better because our, our varsity, you know, offense was being a scout team versus our defense. So the iron serpent's iron approach was, was tremendous. But those are the things that kind of got us over the hump. Defensively was able to concentrate and make adjustments coming off the field because all 11 guys were, you know, on the huddle sideline, you know, looking at the iPads, the TV screens, and coaches can make some adjustments instead of waiting to six guys come off of offense or four guys come off special teams. They were all there together. And then, of course, talk about um your quarterback. Obviously, you had – you – made the two quarterback system work with, with, um, Stepan and, um, and Nate, um, mm-hmm. 
people look at the year and say, okay, you know what I mean? If you if you have two quarterbacks, you don't have none. But when you look right. at you guys, you have you had like a proven you have a proven athlete and also mm-hmm. a pure pocket passer. I know we talked a lot about Nate. Um, of course, his story. Um, of course, we. I mean, like you know, he played in Canada. Um, you know, he's really. I mean, he. Re- I mean, I, I, that's probably one of the best deep balls I've ever seen him throw was in that game mm-hmm. against um South Christian. I mean, he looked his his throwing ability looked pure. You know what I mean? I've never. Mm-hmm. You know, I've seen quarterbacks that have. You know, that have um have had great arms like that. I mean, like, but Nate's arm was was fantastic. And then you put pair him up with Stepan. And of course we know Stepan, um, you know, you look at that combination, that was like pure lightning and thunder this season at the quarterback position for you guys. Yeah, having two quarterbacks was a huge blessing. You know, they really fed off and complimented each other, you know. Watching them work together collectively was was the best part about it. There was never any egos involved. And, you know, they were each other's biggest fans when you were not on the field. And I think that showed a lot of maturity, especially on Stefan's part, being a returning starter from the junior year and then being asked to play a different role as a senior. But understanding that individual accomplishments come from overall team success. You know, so even in a in a split role, I would probably say that Stefan Buford was our MVP. You and, know, he had seven games this year where he threw a touchdown, ran for a touchdown, and caught a touchdown. So he put up some really good numbers, and I was able to use that film to help get him recruited. So, you know, beyond a lot of these things, is that's my ultimate goal, to make sure they got next-level opportunities. And you look at, you got a lot of players that are going to be next level players. I mean, we mentioned Ramity. Um, I know that, I know Dakota's only is going to be a sophomore next year. Um, obviously with step on, um, you, but every good team has to have a really good line and you guys have a really good, good line on both sides of football. So, Mm -hmm. you know, and talk about your line play, obviously, um, Obviously, that was very instrumental in the um in this postseason run for you guys. I mean, the offensive line. Credit to myself. I'm no offensive line coach. No, I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just playing. But <laughs> the offensive line played great all year. You know, we we uh, uh you know we we pride ourselves on obnoxious communication, and we pride ourselves on finishing. Um, you know what we start, and you know it be it blocks, plays, pass sets, whatever. The offensive line um, came together and, and, and dominated this season. You know, um, through 14 games, we only gave up six sacks all year. We didn't give up any pressures or sacks in the state championship game versus a really good South Christian defense. Like, there was a brick wall they built around them. And even on the sideline, trying to make adjustments, they would just stop me and say, Coach, put the clipboard down. We got this. And I would just back up. But you're talking about four out of five guys that have been starters for three or more years that, you know, have been in the trenches with each other through the tough times. So these opportunities right here made things much easier for us. Defensive line was a little bit younger. They, it took them a while to grow up. We knew that we were replacing three out of four starters on the defensive line from last year. So it took them a while to jail. And um, they had to do it quickly because they played a string of great running backs. You know, the kids from Lake Orion is really good. Isaiah Marshall ran it. His running backs were good. You know, Roseville keeps some stud athletes. But even in the playoffs, the kid from Goodrich, the running back from Airport, the running back from Crosslex, arguably top 10 backs in the state. Like, these guys can run. And, and for our defensive line to come together to help slow these guys down was a tremendous accomplishment by the end of the year. And then, of course, you have the linebacking core. I mean, Willie Powell back. I mean, that was – I mean, like, having that experience in the back seven. I mean, mm-hmm. obviously your son Jacob in the secondary. Um, in that game against Grand Rapids South Christian, I mean, like, you kind of – you know what I mean? I mean, they had to play, especially when times got tough. 
they really stepped up at the end. Obviously, we talked about that stop um, mm -hmm. earlier, and then obviously your defense, your um, your your back seven was re been really good all year long. I mean, like you look at what people would say about Harper Woods; they got a great offense, but their defense, your defense, was absolutely nasty this year. When you look at it with your um with the play of your defense. Yes, defense developed a, uh, a, a, a identity and a mentality that they was going to be blue collar. They was going to punch a clock, bring a lunch, and go to work every day. And that's kind of what they did. They took it personal, uh, some of the things they read in the media. They took it personal, uh, some things they saw on film. You know, people were saying, well, you know, we're going to run directly at y'all, and we're going to do this and do that. They wanted to be the hammer and not the nail. They wanted to dictate what teams were going to be able to try to do. And they controlled that for the most part. So they were definitely out there hunting this season. I'm proud of all of them guys. And when you look at next season, of course, you're going to have a proven starter in Nate coming back. You have Dakota mm -hmm. at wide receiver. Um, I call mm -hmm. I call Nate and um, Dakota basically this generation's version of Jeff Smoker and Charles Rogers. Um, right. especially at Michigan State, you know, remember that connection, I know. Um, mm -hmm. and then you look at, of course, you do lose, um, you do, you got several, you got several teams in your defense coming back. Um, when you look at the returning starters, um, for next season, um, mm -hmm. obviously, what are some holes you're going to have to fill, especially for next year? Um, we've been fortunate. We're graduating from really good athletes. We have 20 seniors on this team. Um, next year, the biggest holes we'll have to fill will be replacing four offensive linemen. That will be the biggest one, I would say. But also replacing four out of the five members of our secondary. You know, um, but our younger levels, you know, our, our middle school team, our junior varsity, were really strong in those two areas. So we're looking forward to the next generation of guys stepping in and being prepared for their opportunity. So we know through the off season, we're going to be able to continue to help these guys grow and develop, but offensive line and probably our secondary will be the biggest losses in terms of what we need to really focus and work on going into next year. And when you look at any, when you look at next year, you know what I mean? Of course, um, of course, you know, um, I'm not sure if the division realignments or all that are out, but all that, but, um, you know, you're looking at, you know, possibly, you know, if playing like, you know, you're going to, I mean, most likely I think you might be in the white again next year playing against the likes of Southfield Groves, um, you know, and Rochester, obviously when you look at, when you look at a game that really, you know, changed the tone of your season, what game would have been this season? What was the game that, change the tone for you guys Birmingham Groves week six our last regular season home game senior night we lost you mm -hmm. know we, we we lost we played decent they made one more play than we did uh we lost and the team was divided it was down you know it was a point where we either was going to we just had to make some decisions so we had a few uh, senior player-led meetings. Mm -hmm. And the guys had to basically recommit themselves to playing football here. And coming out of those meetings, the decision was made that the buck stops here. We're not losing another game this season. And we have it. So that Groves game was the turning point for us. And when you look at, of course, we mentioned the schedule earlier in there. You had some tough losses. I mean, Lake Orion, Southfield Arson Tech, and Groves. I mean, like, those mm -hmm. were three games that um, were really tough on you guys. Um, I also thought maybe a game that really, you know, I thought was I thought was a great turning point for you guys was winning that game at Roseville. I mean, like, win against Roseville because, like, you look at that game, got you guys ready for the playoffs. Obviously, you know, Roseville came in. You know, they just knocked off Romeo a couple prior, a couple weeks prior to that. Um, I thought that was a big win for you guys to get that one, especially heading into the postseason and getting home field throughout the postseason. Yeah, that was huge for us. That Roseville game is the one that put us over the top in terms of the number one overall seed 
a uh, big game for us. Once again, we had lost the year previous to that team, you know, in in a in a in an awful fashion. I think it was twenty eight zero or twenty eight six. It was our last game of the year. Of course, we didn't make the playoffs, so that one, you know, that fire burned for a full year. So being able to get some redemption out of that was a, a tremendous uplift going into the playoffs. Because we know that at, at whatever they were, seven and two or six and three, being a division two team, it will put us over that hump. We felt that, you know, a huge part of our run was decided by us being able to play those first three weeks at home. Mm-hmm. You know, so home field advantage was definitely something that we needed. One, to just be comfortable and play, you know. Not necessarily any other thing than that that we can control, but we can control, you know, when we play and, and, and where we play. So we just tried to use those things to our advantage. But Rosefield game was definitely a signature win. And another one I thought was a signature win was that game at Clarkston on their homecoming. I mean, like you guys having to go up to Clarkston to take on a very good Wolves program. Um what was that atmosphere like for you having to make that travel up I-75 to take on a very good Clarkson program on their homecoming? That one was uh that was a heavy lift. One, we didn't know which team was going to show up. Reminder, you know, I think I think that game was I think it was immediately following the Groves loss. If mm-hmm. not, it was one game in between. But um Knowing that it was homecoming and, and talking to other people who play in the OAA or coach in the OAA, I was led to understand that, you know, not many schools go out to, you know, northern Oakland County out to Clarkston and win. Mm-hmm. Especially they don't win the way we did. You know, we kind of dominated that game and it was senior night and homecoming. So that one was eye open. I think that's when the kids started to really believe, well, hold on. We can really, we really got something here. We can do, we can do some special things with this group. So, you know, the buy-in was a hundred percent by the time we got to Clarkson's game. And then in that game, I just couldn't believe that you guys dominated, especially in the air. I mean, like, especially in like third and long situations, like I'm going like, you know, if you're like, you're at third and 32 and all that, then you're throwing touchdowns. I'm going like, what the heck? I'm going like, oh my goodness gracious, you know? And, right. and, you know, and I think that was another turning point with that Clarkson game. I mean, obviously getting into the playoffs and of course, you know, rolling, rolling, you know, when you look at that game. Mm. So I think those were the turning points, obviously with those three games. And then, um, obviously with the, with the community, I mean, now with football season over, um, what's going to be next for coach Odin, um, this off season. Well, my there is no off season for us. We mm-hmm. we like to say there's two seasons at Harper Woods. There's football season and then there's waiting on football season. Mm-hmm. So and while we wait, we train, we lift, we develop, we 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 do some academic work. We we do a, a bunch of things to try to get recruiting. So what's next for me is trying to find homes for these twenty seniors. We've been very fortunate in that off-season approach, there were 17 of the 20 already have a scholarship offer to consider. So mm-hmm. our goal is 100%, though. So we're just trying to find homes for these guys, the best fits available, and that's the tradition for us that never graduates. And then, of course, heading into the next season, of course, Harper Woods, I expect them to be back in the in the, in the the conversation, not only in the um, not only in the OA, but also in the postseason. Um you now you look at next year, you're gonna be the hunted in division four. So that's gonna be a different challenge for you guys going forward, especially with the program you have now. Yeah, we look forward to those challenges. You know, we're gonna enjoy this one though for, for a little while. We're gonna heal up our bodies. We're gonna then we're gonna to start to prepare. Mm-hmm. You know, I think as much as we'll be targeted, our guys will be hungrier to try to get back and repeat. So I think that, you know our younger guys getting to experience that or watch it on TV and they'll be chomping at the bit for their opportunity, which will be next year. So we're excited about what the future holds for Harper Woods football. Before I let you go, coach, um, 
obviously, you know, recapping the season, we talked about this. I mean, like, you know, we talked about what's next for the Pioneers. Um, when you look at Harper Woods, um, obviously, you know, people are going to say, well, Harper Woods, you know what I mean? Like, now you can call Harper Woods now a state champion. Mm -hmm. yep. Yes, we've, we've been waiting for six years to be able to say that, you know, to be able to call ourselves champs, to be amongst the elite. And now that we've reached there, you know, we're, we're just excited for the opportunity to try to defend this thing. Mm -hmm. um, before I let you go, I do want to get your thoughts on um, Southfield Arson Tech. They, of course, they won the Division One State Championship against Belleville yesterday. Of course, we talked about the um, relationship you and Coach Marshall had um, have. I mean, like, of course, I mean, like, what was your thought process of seeing um, seeing A&T win the Division One State Championship? Very, very proud of those guys, man. Like I said, both programs, that's our thats our sister school over there. You know, yeah, we're in the same division now, but we've been working together for over 20 years in my coaching career, you know, with off-season camps and scrimmages and things like that. Even when we both clinched our trip to Fort Field, we celebrated, you know, two Saturdays ago together, both staffs together, and we'll have a combined state championship celebration as well. I think there were 24 guys between their team and our team that played together in youth football. So there's definitely a lot of kinship and friendship there. Very proud of those guys for being able to slay Goliath, you know, and, and, and believing that they can get it done. And it just shows how tough and intense the OAA conference is, you know, where you can have two state champions come out of one conference i think that's an amazing thing to show you know the level of football and the quality of football we play in this conference and it but for southfield super excited for him uh coach marshall brought his whole team you know on buses to our game on saturday and in return our whole team returned to fort field last night to watch and witness their history being made as well and when you look at the dynamics of the OA, of course, we mentioned this uh, many times, just the different brands of football you see. I mean, you can play teams that are heavy heavy hitters, hard hitters, you know, the teams that are, you know, a lot of skilled players. So the OA as a whole has a lot of different dynamics in this conference when you look at the brand of football each team plays in this conference. Yes, it does. Different brands of football, different styles of football, different defensive, uh, you know, schemes. You have got to be prepared to pair here. And I think the players that play in this league are prepared for next level athletics when they leave because of the multitude of things that you see that mirror the college game. So I think that's a tremendous, you know, tip of the hat to all the coaches in our OAA conference. Of course, I'm Coach Oden. Thank you really much for joining us this season for the podcast and also for this whole season. I'm looking forward to talking to you in the future. Um, wish you guys the best of luck. Congratulations on winning the Division Four State Championship and also the Community of Harper Woods. Congratulations on a very good season. Oh, appreciate you for having us, Sammy, and, 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 and giving us the spotlight the last few weeks. And uh, we look forward to continuing on and, and, and doing the league proud. Thank you really much, Coach. God bless, Coach. Thanks. Of course, that was Coach um, Rob Oden here. Of course, the um, Coach of Harper Woods um, winning the Division Four State Championship. Um, thank you for him for joining us this week here on the podcast. Um, a lot to talk about, you know what I mean, when you look at the Division I state championship. Um, hoping to have Coach Marshall on uh, maybe sometime next week um, to go to recap the game against Belleville. I mean, but when you look at that game, it was just absolutely insane. Um, just describing that game, watching that game um, unfold. I mean, here's a team in Belleville who's coming in with a 38-game winning streak, um, really hasn't been tested. I don't think Bryce Underwood lost as a starter at Belleville. Um, you look at A&T coming in to that game, and, you know, and 
everything was stacked stacked against him. I mean, obviously, there's really no ifs, ands, or buts when you look at that game. Was a t came into that game with nothing to lose, everything to gain. And that was the key. And you look at, of course, to talk in the podcast with Coach Marshall last week, the game plan, you know, you kind of had to know was a t had to control the game. They had to control it. And they got off to a good start. Thanks to Matthias Davis' um, I mean, two touchdowns early on. I mean, like, I mean, he scored the first one from four yards out behind a really good offensive line in that game. I got to give the offensive line of Southfield Arson Tech a lot of credit here because they're the ones that are doing all the dirty work inside in the trenches. They're doing all the work. You know, they're blocking, you know, giving their, their skilled players a chance to to make plays. And the offensive line of Southfield Arson Tech deserves a lot of credit in that game against Belleville, a very solid Belleville defense. Um, <laughs> and, you know, in that game, you know, you kind of look at it and, you know, and then Belleville responded. Of course, they got a very crazy interception, a one-handed, I mean, like, just it was just a crazy interception. It's hard to describe, you know, this, the athleticism that, that had to be put in. Which led to a Bill Bill touchdown. Bill took a 7 6 lead. Um, Davis went again and scored from one yard out, um, making it 12 7 in favor of AT. But Southfield Arson Tech's defense really was the story. The Warriors' defense was the story in that game. Because, you know, you look at Belleville, what they've done offensively. They have beaten people. They destroyed people. I mean, they beat a very good Celine team. They beat a really good Northfield team twice and then beat Davison. But A&T had a really good defensive game plan. And they and they executed that game plan and shut down Bryce Underwood. Um, And they, they shut Bella's offense down, you know, getting a couple fourth down stops, which led to A&T... Going on the going in the ball, going the field again, they get another touchdown and a two point conversion. Go up twenty seven at one point. Belleville kicked the field goal, make it twenty to ten. Um, actually, Belleville kicked the field goal up. It was it, actually it was um twelve to ten at one point, and then A and T with um Zeke to um Tashi Braceville scored a touchdown, makes it eighteen to ten. And then gets the two point conversion. You're up twenty to ten, and then you recover an onside kick. You know that to me is gutsy as it is. When you recover an onside kick, having another chance to score, that's incredible. And then Ant almost had a chance to score, and then couldn't get it. You know, cause time ran out with five seconds left. So you're up twenty to ten, and then third quarter. Belleville gets the ball first, a t stops him, and then the play from Zeke to Xavier Bowman, which led to a touchdown, a and up 28-10. to So, there's panic with Belleville. You know, they go to their bread and butter, they go deep. Um, and a and um, you know, um, they end up throwing a nice pass, and um, it was 28-18. Um, a and and then, and then... A&T went on offense, got stopped on fourth and two. Um, people are going to say, well, in that call, was it the right call to go for it on fourth and two or just punt the ball? I mean, if you punt the ball, you know, so I don't know what Coach Marshall was thinking there, but, you know, I think he had enough confidence in the offense to go for it, but they didn't get it. Belba goes down and scores. Um... And we got a 28-25 game. Um, and then Zeke throws an interception in the fourth quarter. Belleville goes down, takes the lead. So now it's 32-28. So you kind of think, okay, this game's over. Um, you kind of think, okay, Belleville's going to come out of here and win. I mean, whoa, whoa, Southfield, he had a nice run at it, you know. 
but this is not self inter well, this is not how it meant to be. A and T, they've been here before. Everybody thought the game's over, right? Wrong. A and T's been here before. Look at what happened last week against West Bloomfield. A and T had a chance to win on the final drive. They went down the field, gave a touchdown late, went down the field, led a course to a big touchdown by Zeke. What beholds? Zeke gets a touchdown from 13 yards out. Actually, 10 yards out. Gives them a 36, and they get the two-point conversion. So now you're up 36-32. Now, why is the two-point conversion big? Because instead of the field goal that Belleville needs, <laughs> you know, now they're going to need to score a touchdown. So now you're up from, instead of being up three, you know, with Belleville having a chance to tie the game with the field goal, they got, now it's four, and now you got to go get a touchdown to win. So, Belleville has one last chance at it. One last chance. So, Reggie Gardner, the defensive lineman, comes in. He comes in and pressures Underwood, making him throw an errant throw. And it was intercepted. It was intercepted. And a and wins. a and wins the Division I State Championship. Their first one ever as a school. First one. And the OAA second division, second state championship in a span of two days. That says something. You look at, in that game, A&T had a never-say-die attitude. Never-say-die. They never quit. Never panicked. And I'll tell you what. People are going to say, well, you know, praising Zeke, obviously. But I'm going to give you something else. You got to give that offensive line credit. You got to give that offensive line was very instrumental in that game. Very instrumental. They played excellent football. They played well. I mean, they played really well. I mean, give the props the offensive line. I know a lot of us here, we praise Isaiah Marshall. We praise Xavier Bowman. We praise Tashi Braceful. But they, the running game with Matthias Davis, he had a great game. When he scored two rushing touchdowns, especially against that defense, that says a lot. Um, obviously Zeke, you know what he does, but you got to give this defense a lot of credit here. This defense was the story. And I'm, you know, and yes, you look at a and offense, you know, it's very dynamic, but this defense was phenomenal, just phenomenal against that offense who, that had scored over 60 points. You know, in in at least three games this year. They scored over 60. They've even scored against very good teams over 60. I mean, you look at the game, and you look at in their postseason games. I mean, you look at what A&T in the postseason this year. They had to go through a four-week stretch where they had to play the likes of Detroit Cass Tech, Clarkston, Groves, Harper Woods. That's brutal. That's a brutal four-game stretch. That is a brutal stretch. And for them to win all four of them, that tells you how good that you know how special that that Warrior team was. And then when you look at that Week 8 loss to West Bloomfield, I mean, that was a tough loss for them. But you know what? They didn't give in. They didn't give in. And when you look at the po the bracket, how it was laid, laid out, I mean, they had to play Dearborn Forts in first, which been which was a really good matchup for them. And then they had that rematch with Detroit Cast Tech. And in that game, it was clear as day the Warriors were their better team. I mean, last season, let's not forget, Detroit Cast Tech beat them in the playoffs. And AT went and returned the favor. They beat them twice. That is not easy to do. That is not easy 
beating a team twice in one year. And especially a team that is as caliber as Detroit Cats Tech was. And they are going to be solid again next year. And then you have the regional final where they go into Chippewa Valley, take on the Comac Red champion, Big Reds of Chippewa Valley, well coaching of Scott Merchant. And, you know, you look at a course for OA teams, take going on the road in the place like Chippewa Valley, Macomb, Dakota, or Utica Eisenhower, or Romeo. That's not easy to do. And it's not easy to go in there and win. A&T went in there and beat a very good Chippewa Valley team. <laughs> they went in there and beat a really good team. That's not the rematch with West Bloomfield at Troy, which was a tense drama. It was a tense drama between those two teams, those two rivals, two really good, well-coached teams with the Lakers and the Warriors. It was a heck of a game. And Zeke, and Zeke of course, won it on a one-yard touchdown run after Rick Nance scored late. You know, with, with about, I think, about 40 seconds left in that game. And they had enough time to go down and win it. And then, of course, came Belleville. I mean, people look at that matchup. David versus Goliath. I mean, a t came in, I think, with the right mindset. Nothing to lose. Everything to gain. They went in there and took Belleville's best shot and then beat Belleville. Now, I'm not sure if Belleville came in this game overconfident. I mean, but I'll tell you what right now. And I'm not being mean here to Bell, I mean to 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 Belleville. I think Belleville's got an issue against the OA. I really do. Because even with the Adams game, if Adams was healthy in that game, they had that lineman back in that game, I think Adams still beats him. But you look at the games against West Bluefield. I remember when Donovan Edwards went went nuts against them. Um, back in 2020, that led West Bluefield to, the, to their state championship. Um, you look at a course, and then if I'm Belleville next year, I would seriously look at playing an OA school week one. I would seriously consider it because your record against the OA, I think, is one in three. I think you're one. I think you got your one or two wins against the OA, and that's not sounding cocky. That's sounding. That's telling facts. Because you look at that schedule with Belleville. I'm not sure if the Lakes, if the KLAA is going to get them better. Because you look until Belleville plays the OA. I mean, it's going to be hard to really trust them. It really is. Doesn't matter how good Belleville is. They've got to start playing some OA teams, I think. Because I'll tell you what right now. The OA in football is like the modified version of the, of the Southeastern Conference. Because you have proven teams from the North. You have Oxford, Clarkston, Lake Orion, Adams, Stony Creek. All those teams are grinders. West Bloomfield, in the middle, they're a grinder. Groves and Seaholm, they're tough teams as well. And then you look at, of course, the um, and then you look at teams in the in the in the in the in the lower level in the blue. You look at, of course, Avondale. Avondale's coming back to life a little bit here. You look at, of course, you have Troy, Troy, Athens. I mean, like, you know, they've had they've been up and down the last few years. You look at Berkeley's had their moments of of greatness. You look at Royal Oak, an up and coming team. Ferndale's an up and coming team. Um. And then you look at, of course, Harper Woods and Southfield, both teams this year. Those two teams winning Division I and four state championships, respectively. <laughs> so my recommendation to the rest of the state, and I'm going to be honest with you, play the OA. Play the OA teams. So I'll tell you what right now, you're going to get better by playing them. You're going to get better by playing them. You know, and I think right now when you look at the when you look at the OA right now as a football conference right now, this is it's as good as it gets. It's as good as it gets. You know, when you look at 
state champions have won state titles in this league. You look at, of course, Oxford. You look at Clarkston, Lake Orion, West Bloomfield. Um, you look at, of course, Troy's 1-1. One, one. You look at, of course, now you can put Harper Woods and Southfield Arts and Tech in this conversation. You know, you got Seaholm and Groves. They're up and coming teams. You look at, of course, um, you know, you got Ferndale, Berkeley, Pontiac, Avondale. I mean, like, I'm telling you right now, the OAA as a conference in football, it is one of the best in the state of Michigan. If not the best in the state of Michigan. And you look at, in Saturday and Sunday, both those games prove it. When you're looking with Harper Woods, playing in the OA has really helped them. You know, look where it got them. You look at, of course, Southfield Arson Tech, playing at Murder's Row of a schedule. Look where it got them. It got them, it got them state championships. And playing in this conference, playing in the OA, I'm telling you, it has its advantages. So my advice to those who want to play OA schools in the non-conference, my suggestion, play them. Because one, it'll get you better, and I think it'll get you pre mentally prepared for the state tournament. So that's my take on, that's my rant of the week when you look at it, when you look at it. So that's my thoughts on on that. So, anyway, congratulations to both Harper Woods and Southfield Arts and Tech for winning division, um, winning division four and division one, respectively, state champions. Um, obviously, when you look at heading into next season, there's going to be a lot of excitement now. Obviously, um, looking at next season, um. A lot to look at. I mean, really a lot of storylines. We're going to keep an eye on a lot of things around the league. Obviously, that is for sure. So, we got a lot to talk about, um, you know, with football heading into this offseason. Um, a lot to look at as we look into it heading into the offseason. Um, now, we're, we're going to be heading into basketball season. Um, <coughs> I did release my column. Um, basketball starts this week. You want to take a look at my basketball preview? It's at the blog. It's at, it's on the blog at Saginaw Bay forty six fifty at blogspot.com. I have um, posted the preview for basketball for boys, girls. I'm just about done. Release just about done with the um, column, so I will release that sometime later this week. Um, we'll pre and of course, both preview shows are up on the ON TV um, YouTube page if you want to take a look at them. Um, Heading into the season, of course, I has some, has interviews from other coaches around the league. Um, heading into the season, so a lot to look forward to. I mean, like as we head into the winter months, heading into December. Um, you know, obviously, so the OA today proved itself to be one of the greatest football conferences in the state. They have proven that again with winning a state championship and. Bottom line is, you know, you know, you look at, you look, especially with Southfield Arson Tech and Harper Woods, I'm telling you right now, you know, you know, the OA's got a great future ahead of it. I mean, they've won state championships um, in soccer this year with Troy Athens. Um, and that's something to really watch for going forward. All right, everybody, I'm going to sign off here. Make sure you follow the blog at saginaw 4650 at .com. Um... Once again, I'm going to say congratulations to both Harper Woods and um, Safford Arson Tech on winning the state championship. Thank you to Coach Rob Oden for um, calling in this week here on the podcast. So we'll see what happens going forward. All right, everybody, we're signing off here. Take care. God bless, and I'll see you all next week. Everybody, take care, and I'll see you all then. Take care and see you then. God bless all.